Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's uh, virtual lounge uh, featuring our media production and design program. My name is Stanley Philippe. I I've been told that uh, my camera has been lagging a little bit today, so I apologize for the, the visuals, but hopefully you're still very excited to hear more about uh, this unique program. You know, uh, last week we had our uh, journalism program uh, talk a bit more about um, their degree, and they were celebrating 75 years here at Carleton. And what's cool about the School of Journalism and Communication is it's not only home to journalism, not only home to communication and media studies, but also home to one of our newest, brightest, most exciting programs that we have to offer. So you're going to be uh, hopefully really into uh, what our speakers have to say tonight about media production and design and how much it can really help uh, in the 21st century. It is a very kind of modern, relevant program. Uh, what's also modern and relevant is hearing from you and hearing what you have to say. And so please do us a favor, utilize the live event Q&A throughout tonight's event uh, to ask your questions, questions you have about this program, about where it may take you, really anything Carlton related, please ask those questions. And what we'll try our very best to do is answer those questions throughout uh, tonight's live event. Okay, I'm gonna get off screen and I'm gonna let uh, someone who has hopefully a better connection, uh, definitely a better connection to this program than I do. Uh, this, this person's name is uh, Vicki MacArthur and she is the program director of the uh, media production and design degree. Uh, so Vicki, once you see yourself on screen, uh, you know what to do. Best of luck. Well, thanks for that intro, Stanley. Um, I've always felt like media production and design is the best program in the School of Journalism and Communication, but it's always nice to hear that I'm not biased, that this is a shared opinion uh, from outside the department as well. Uh, so my name is Vicki MacArthur. I am the program director for media production and design, and I'm currently one of three faculty that teach in the program. Um, we are a brand new program, so we are currently in our third year at Carleton, which means our very first cohort is uh, in their third year of study. So many of them are going off to do their co-op actually uh, starting in January, which is very exciting. Um, so I usually teach in the first year of the program. I like doing that because it's a great way to meet the incoming students and get to know them um, because I'm usually going to be your point of contact throughout if you have questions about um, adding a minor or which kind of courses you should study or the kinds of jobs you might be looking for as you're sort of getting close to graduating. Um, I'll take a step back though and talk a little bit more about the program, sort of how it's put together, um, and then hopefully that should give you a good idea of what it is. So media production and design is an interdisciplinary program. So we draw from multiple disciplines of study. So where some other programs you go into more traditional programs, you're sort of always studying one type of academic subject. Uh, media production and design pulls from journalism, um, law, photography, design, programming, all different types of disciplines that sort of contribute to what will be your future professional practice. Uh, so it is a 20 credit program that's offered, it's housed primarily in the School of Journalism Communication, but it's also supported by uh, the School of Information Technology as well. So you take the bulk of your required courses with us in the School of Journalism and Communication, you take 3.5 of your credits with the School of Information Technology, and then we actually have room for 8.0 credits worth of electives. And so what many of our students like to do is pursue a minor to further contextualize their studies. I know a really popular minor is the minor in entrepreneurship. People want to sort of go on to freelance and want to have some idea of sort of how to run their, their business and whatnot as they're promoting themselves and, and sort of going through all that aspect. Um, there are people who might be looking at film as a really nice complementary um, minor to what we do in BMPD. Carlton has so many different official minors and then a whole bunch of other programs that can sort of become minors if you pick and choose the right courses. So it really is highly flexible. So not only do we have this really nice interdisciplinary feel, but you really can customize with those 8.0 credits to really make the degree feel like your own. Um, so let me talk a little bit, I guess, about the courses that you take generally. And I'm not going to list every single one, uh, but the ones that you take with our core media production and design faculty uh, are usually split up into two offerings. So often in the fall, you'll take a theory based course which is more like a lecture where you learn a little bit about the history of storytelling, um, different types of uh, digital platforms that are used for telling stories. Uh, these can include things like um, hypertext stories, uh, 360 video, virtual reality, augmented reality, 
um, serious games, all different types of platforms. Um, and then usually in the winter, there'll be a complimentary course to that, which is uh, labeled as a workshop. So in the first term, that's a cohort of a maximum of 60, where you're all maybe in a lecture together. And then in the winter, you'll break off into two smaller groups, maximum of 30, to do the workshop components. So you'll take the theory you learned in the fall and apply it in a more hands-on course in the winter. And this sort of cycle repeats as you go throughout the program. So in on the theory side, you're learning about sort of theory of storytelling, storyboard, process, um, managing assets, collaborating on projects. And then over in the School of Information Technology, you're taking more of your traditional programming courses. So we do learn um, a programming language. You take uh, two classes in a programming language. Um, you get a bit of an exposure to XHTML and CSS, and JavaScript and jQuery. Um, and then sort of a look more broadly at uh, digital media technology from sort of a more technical side. Uh, so within that uh, program, the 20 credit program, you can also add to it a co-op option. So we do have co-op um, and that's something that you would discuss on your way in and you would get to know Pam, who is our academic advisor, who would help you sort of figure out the timing of co-op, the courses you would need, the grade average you would need and all of that. Uh, but basically, um, that's that's the bulk of our program. Um, I can tell you that often on, in our workshop courses, we like to partner with um, community institutions. So I know usually in my first year class, we'll often pair with a local museum. Ottawa, um, if you're not from around here, Ottawa seems to have um, the largest number of museums per capita, I think in Canada or something. We have so many different and distinct museums here. Um, we have uh, the History Museum, the War Museum, um, we have the Nature Museum, which is kind of like 12 mini museums in one big museum, um, Aviation and Space, Science and Technology, the Farm Museum. So there's all these different sort of partners that we can uh, collaborate with. And often what that'll involve is uh, visiting that museum, talking to their curator staff, talking to their interactive team, learning a little bit about their process, and then trying to create a working prototype that would sort of fit with the theme of that uh, museum. I know in the second year are courses that are often taught by Professor Graham. She likes to partner with the NAC and other art institutions. And I can't speak to third year yet. I'm not entirely sure what, who Professor McKnight is partnering with, but I know again in her course, she's also looking to do a partner approach to her courses. So it's kind of nice about that, because um, I have taught at other institutions before, is often those type of partnerships are reserved for fourth year students. So basically once we've taught you everything you know, um, then, you know, then we set you off into the wild. But we actually like doing that much, much earlier in this program and for a number of reasons. Number one, um, if you're doing that once a year, every four years, you get a lot of experience without even going to co-op of partnering with these different types of sort of uh, parapublic institutions, nonprofits, um, art galleries, museums, things like that. So you get a lot of uh, sort of contextualized experience while you're learning. Um, but also it's uh, it's beneficial to the partner too to get exposure to what the creative process is like for us. So we're also sort of educating them a little bit about what the freelancing looks like and the kinds of things that we can do here. So it gives you this really great contextualized experience. It also gives you some really nice portfolio work. It gets you known by some different institutions within the city, uh, which can sort of help to build your portfolio from very early on. So we, we value those types of experiences right from first year because they're just so rich in learning opportunities. So Stanley, does that about sort of cover um, how much you'd like to hear about the program from the get-go or would you like me to keep talking about the courses or? No, I think that's a really great kind of launching point. And, uh, and one of the cool things you mentioned about the third year and not really knowing because it is a, a pretty new program. Uh, it, it started in 2018 and and it's going to be fun to kind of see where uh, the students take it once they graduate. And speaking of students, the next person you're going to see on screen uh, is a student who has been with us, I guess, since uh, the birth of this program and uh, can really say more about what that experience has been like. And so I like to give uh, Julia a chance to to share her experience kind of you know, nav navigating uh, a, a new program, a new experience, being one of the first ones to really benefit from this uh, amazing uh, degree. So Julia, um, please go ahead and share your story. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as he said, I'm one of the first students who joined the program back when it was created in 2018. And one of the benefits of being in a new program such as this is that you're essentially entering into a community. So media production and design 
um, as we said, is a new program. So you will be entering in with about uh, 30 other students in your year and you will have the opportunity to um, enhance your relationships with the other students as well. So for example, when you're in like a smaller um, amount of students in your program, you have the ability to build the relationships faster because you're essentially working together with a lot of your different projects and you have the opportunity to um, essentially meet your fellow students in a smaller class size and it will be highly beneficial for you. Another thing about me is that I am one of the co-op students, so I'm going to be entering into my first co-op term um, actually uh, in January. So if you have any questions about co-op or like how the co-op um, system works at Carleton, I would be happy to answer them. So about about Carleton and the media production and design program. So we have a lot of interesting courses. And one of them that actually is my favorite was the interactive multimedia and design um, course that takes place during first year. And one of the reasons it's my favorite is because it actually introduces you to a lot of different topics that perhaps you wouldn't get in like other programs. So for example, within this one course, um, you're introduced to like, uh, game development, character design, um, game design, and you even learn um, special coding languages, as well as learning how to translate binary code. So it's a really interesting class that takes place in the first year of, yeah, first year uh, fall term. So it's a good introduction and it's a good way to introduce you to the program. And it's essentially what the program is about is introducing you to digital media and um, various forms such as like um, the various coding languages and game design that you perhaps might be interested in as a career. So about Carleton, what did I wish going into university was perhaps um, it's important to start early when you're planning out um, how you expect your university career to follow. So I'm in a film minor currently, and when it comes to minors, you have to plan out um, specifically what electives you're going to take because there's various electives that you have to take in order to achieve that minor. And in first year, you're definitely able to like pick whatever electives you want. It's just important to realize what electives you need to take so you have that early start. And that way, um, and later during the university career, you can take whatever electives that you want. Like for example, if you wanna take French as an elective, you're free to do that. If you wanna take, um, introduction to documentary, you're free to do that, even if it's not like film being your minor. So there's a lot of different electives you can choose, just it's important to realize um, what particular minor you want to take if you want to take a minor. And if you are taking a minor, realize what electives are necessary to achieve a minor. Um, one particular um, extracurricular you might enjoy if you are entering into MPAD and you're joining our little family is MPAD Society. So MPAD Society is also new. It started um, essentially this year. We have a Discord server. And in the server, you're able to meet all sorts of students from MPAD. So it doesn't even um, have to be from your own year. It can be from the upper years as well. So for example, um, third year, second year, and first year students are all together, and we essentially do um, games together, such as like uh, multiplayer games, or even like Secret Santa we're having um, at the end of this month. And it's a good way to meet the other students in your program, even if they aren't in um, your year as well, which is great considering that we're all having to stay home and we're not able to go to campus and meet each other that way. Um, is there any other questions that perhaps I can answer for you? Yeah, that's, that's a, a good point to, to remind folks that uh, we are having a conversation about 
the media production and design program at Carleton, and we definitely invite your questions. If you have any questions for Julia, third year student, or, or Vicki MacArthur, who is the program director, uh, please feel free to uh, to add those questions to the uh, Q&A. Uh, Julia, I wanted to um, maybe take a trip down memory lane with you and, and, and look back to when you were in uh, high school and you're hearing about this new program. What what was your kind of first reaction to it? What what drew you to it? And were you at all hesitant or nervous about kind of starting your university experience uh, in a in a new space? Yeah, absolutely. So one thing that you guys um, might not know about me yet, for obvious reasons, is that I am actually an artist. So, um, for example, I actually did that uh, picture over there. I love doing anything with art. And but the one thing is, is that I didn't want to enter into fine art. I kind of wanted to have a more well-rounded university experience and I wanted to learn computing languages. And when I first heard about media production and design, I was incredibly happy because it had all of the things I wanted out of the university program of my dreams, basically. Um, you do get the opportunity to practice your art if that's something that you wish to do. You get introduced to a whole sleuth of different computing programs, as Professor Nick Arthur um, mentions. And you have the opportunity to work on various um, projects with different um, communities. And it's incredibly important because, um, as we mentioned, we're entering into a new, um, a new era, a new digital age. And it's important to learn how to adapt and how to essentially tell your story through different mediums. So that is mainly one of the main inspirations between me joining this program. And it was essentially the right choice because I met some of my um, best friends in this program and I've had an amazing experience so far um, practicing my craft and um, building my computing skills. Now, um, you said that you're going to be starting your co-op uh, in January. Uh, first off, um, well, congrats on that. And uh, uh, secondly, uh, where are you working? And then finally, what, um, I guess, uh, how, how was that process? How was the process for you kind of finding a job through co-op? Yeah, so co-op is essentially um, a program at Carleton that starts fairly early. So in second year, um, you were brought into the program based on um, the grades that you have achieved within your first and second year, essentially. So in order to enter co-op, um, there's two options. You can either um, start by applying um, to co-op through your high school. So when you're applying to Carleton, you have the option to enter the co-op stream from there. And if that's what I did. And if you do that, then in second year, you are automatically entered um, to basically, they would look over your grades once you're in second year, then they will determine if you're eligible to continue or not. And I believe that the cutoff is about the, a nine CGPA. That is what it was for me. And after that, you have to take um, a mandatory co-op course. I think it's called Co-op 1000. And you are introduced to the various things about co-op. So they're going to explain to you essentially how it works, kind of like how I'm telling you right now. And you will have different modules that you have to complete. Um, the different modules, it will introduce you to how you uh, perform an interview, how you prepare for your line of work, how you prepare to get a job. It'll teach you things about the job market, things like that. And in that class, you have to um, pass all of the quizzes. And it'll just be quizzes about the modules. And then there's also the final assignment for that class is a resume assignment. So they will teach you how to build a proper resume. And then your final assignment for that class will be actually doing the resume. And then once you pass it, you um, continue. And then you have to, I believe, um, submit resumes to the 
uh, Carlton uh, My Success portal. And you'll have various companies and um, offices that will be looking for students in your line of work. And then you will be sending in your resumes. And then the co-op office will be um, managing that. And then if you get a job offer, they'll inform you. And then you, it continues on like that until your winter term. Okay. Cool. Now, um, I wanted to ask you a question that, that came into the feed and then I'll get Vicky to answer it as well. Um, so the question was, uh, what are some of the online tools that you use to design and do art? So maybe, uh, Julia, you can talk about the stuff that you're using and then maybe Vicky can jump in and talk a bit more broadly about the tools that are available for, for students in the program. Yeah, so I actually use my iPad to do a lot of art. I use the um, online program called Procreate with that. And then I um, use Photoshop for like After Effects or anything. I believe Photoshop's also um, provided as part of the program and Vicky can add more about that. But essentially I use um, drawing apps such as like Procreate. I'm looking into um, Clip Studio Paint and various projects like that. So Mick, Professor MacArthur, do you want to continue about what the program offers? Sure, so um, so in addition to that, I mean, we in the first year, generally we deal largely with sort of free open source software. Um, so we'll look at things like, uh, like Twine, which is used for creating nonlinear stories. Um, in my winter course, we uh, generally do a story in augmented reality, and so I've looked to uh, to existing free software that students can use uh, to do that. Um, as Julia might remember, in her class, uh, we used uh, HP Reveal, which unfortunately was discontinued just at the end of term. Um, and then uh, for the last two years now, we've actually used a Snap Lens Studio, uh, which is created by the creators of Snapchat, basically, and it works with uh, different platforms of theirs. So we use that in, in that course. I know one that I've been interested in using for a while in the classroom has been Adobe Project Arrow, um, which is uh, from, from Adobe, and it's eventually going to be incorporated into the Creative Cloud, um, but currently it's not. It's only available on the iOS platform, but that's generally what I use. So a lot of free software in the first year. Um, when they get into second year, we start using a lot more of the Creative Cloud uh, licensing. And then uh, I know on the iTech side, they use their own software, but generally just for sort of coding and, and design. Now the, the questions are flowing, so thank you folks for, for asking these questions and, and we'll, we'll definitely uh, get to uh, all of them. Uh, the next question I wanted to touch on is uh, a question about coding. So someone asked uh, that they're not particularly into coding or programming, but they're definitely into design. So would this program still be a good fit for that particular student if the design element is what they're really into and the coding is maybe a, a necessary evil <laughs> in, in this particular context? So um, yeah, it's, it's a it's a really interesting point, and I think, for example, like there are a lot of sort of graphic design and uh, media design programs that have almost no coding pro um, requirement, or maybe at the most they might have some HTML, which is uh, which is not the same as like programming. It's more like like markup for web pages. Um, and I, I really actually like the fact that we do include some programming skill in the first and second year, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, Number one, before uh, I was an academic, I was a, a freelancer in a past life. And um, I like to tell my students that uh, even if you don't yourself think you'll be coding, uh, it may happen that either you're going to be paired with a programmer, so you'll be hired on to take on a part of a, of a digital artifact like photography or visual design or video editing or something. Um, so you might be hired to work alongside a programmer and, and create assets for them, or you will inherit a prior project that will have some code in it. So you'll inherit what we call legacy code. So something someone else coded that you're asked to go in and tweak or modify to fit with the new project you're making. And so being able to look at code to understand how coding works um, at a fundamental level is very important. Even if you yourself don't think you're going to go on to be like a software engineer or something like that. I mean, for that, we have computer science and software engineering programs, right? So I think it's very important to tackle code to become familiar with it, kind of like, you know, um, when you first start driving, feeling comfortable lifting the hood to refill your washer fluid, things like that, right? It's really important to sort of not be intimidated by that. And I think also, too, um, when I used to teach HTML classes, we started with code, even though we could have always opened up 
Dreamweaver and started doing design. And the reason is, once you understand what's happening under the hood, you can easily jump into any new software package that comes out today, tomorrow, or next year, or 10 years down the road. So I think it's a really good skill to have, even if your end goal is to be a graphic designer or a visual designer, to have that coding literacy. Yeah. Uh, now, with, with all that kind of coding and designing, uh, there may be a need to kind of prove your uh, your abilities beforehand. So a student wants to know, um, do they have to submit a portfolio to get into this program? No, we don't actually. Um, beyond the general high school admission requirements, there's no portfolio assessment. We assume when you're coming in um, that you don't have any skill with the tools necessarily, or maybe you're skilled in one area, but not the others. We treat everyone coming in as though we're all sort of starting from scratch with regard to theory and practice and everything else. So no, there's no uh, portfolio requirement coming in. Okay, this next question is uh, always a tricky one. So uh, uh, have fun answering this one. Um, so the question is, um, I found this program because I was looking at journalism and now I can't decide between the two of them. I like to do design and graphics, but I also like to write. Any suggestions on how do I decide? Pick us. We're the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> We're so, the best. <laughs> so my my um my suggestion that won't get me in trouble with my director, who's in charge of journalism, um, is that you could always join media production and design and do a minor in journalism. It's very compatible. I will say that a couple of our courses are also cross-listed with journalism. And if you like writing, um, a lot of the emphasis in the second year is also on writing too. So there's a lot of flexibility there. Unfortunately, you can't go the other way around. You can't major in journalism and take a minor in uh, MPAD because we don't currently offer that option, but you can definitely minor in journalism. Now, uh, this this last question that, that we have in the Q&A, and, and folks, if you have any additional questions, please uh, uh, send, them, send them our way. I, I think I'd like to hear uh, Vicky answer that, but also Julia uh, from a student perspective. So the question is, um, what are the possible career pathways for this program? And that may, um, may also lead to a conversation about like, you know, what's happening in the School of Journalism and Communication with three awesome degrees that do kind of serve different purposes and different skills. So, so maybe Vicky, you can start with with the inception of this program, what were some of the different jobs or careers that were envisioned for students graduating from the program? Well, I think, um, I mean, so I can't take credit for the creation of the program. Obviously, there were a lot of conversations that were happening and Chris Waddell, who was the former program director, had a lot to do with sort of its creation. And um, part of it kind of came out of um, a recognition that journalism itself was changing, was becoming more digital. Uh, newsrooms were using a bunch of different platforms in order to tell stories. Um, 360 documentary was starting to really take off with CBC and other broadcasters, but also that there are many, many other institutions that have nonfiction stories to share and they're interested in leveraging digital platforms. But the idea of creating a story um, for a new platform is much more complex than you'd think. You can't take something that's meant for, say, text or print and then shove it into a video. It doesn't work. There's there's different storytelling affordances, different types of blocking, different pacing, things like that that have to be taken into account before you can sort of say, OK, I want this story to be an augmented reality. There's a lot of work in crafting that story or reworking it to fit that medium. So I think initially the the obvious answer to that was, you know, like newsrooms, um, NGOs, governments, anyone who's trying to tell a nonfiction digital story needs a special kind of storyteller to share that. Uh, I remember last year in our, our first year class, I was uh, talking to some students and said, oh, the RCMP were here. They were asking about you guys. And I had to say, for jobs, <laughs> not for anything else, obviously. <laughs> but um, but even the RCMP, like, you know, they're trying to put out um, digital campaigns to teach children about cyberbullying and online safety. And all these types of things may come in the form of um, pamphlets, videos, um, serious games is another avenue where people try to... Um, sort of reach children with messages by putting them into playable environments where they can actually try out scenarios rather than just reading what they're supposed to do or what the correct answer is. Um, we've had people come in from different museums, art galleries, um, in education, they're looking to create uh, content for learners that will help them support, that will support effective learning rather than just being, you know, content slapped into a video. So really, I mean, we have students coming in who have interest in sports, um, journalism, storytelling, filmmaking, um, people who want to create their own indie startups for games, podcasts. And I think especially in the context of the pandemic, we've become hyper aware of how important digital online storytelling really truly is. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 really kind of brought to light that that kind of importance of utilizing whatever tools we have to connect and, and to storytell and to still be kind of engaged uh, uh, with that. Um, Julia, I'm going to bring you back in uh, to uh, to answer that question in a different maybe way. And in in, uh, in in that you're in your third year, you're starting your co-op. Are you already thinking about okay? There's a, a job that's out there that I really want, and if so, what that what is that job? Uh, and and if you're not kind of necessarily kind of doing that deep dive yet, you know, on on, on the spot, what are you hoping to uh, to tackle career wise once you graduate? Yeah, so actually my game plan is to become an animator and my uh, co-op job kind of ties into that. I'm currently working for the CRA as a multimedia specialist. And what that basically entails is that I'm making animated videos um, for introduction to like new employees. So it's a really cool job. It's also one of um, possible jobs that you can get with this program. I'm just like currently writing the notes of the things off of the top of my head. Um, I do know that one of my friends is becoming a graphic designer. So that's also another um, possible position for you if you choose to go through the program because we do learn a lot of visual communication um, information. And that's actually one of the name of one of our most popular popular classes uh, is visual communications where you learn all about graphic design, how to make effective visualizations. Um, also, web developer and game developer are possible pathways for you um, because I believe uh, MacArthur, I remember in the first year you were telling us all about mobile gaming and uh, game development as well. So you do learn a lot of the skills associated with that path. And a lot of the programming we learn is actually for um, websites and like how to make a website and how to effectively make a website. So if you're interested in becoming a web developer, you learn a lot of the skills necessary for that line of work as well. And I know that for my uh, co-op position, I did um, have to mention that I knew a lot of coding languages. So even though I'm essentially doing um, animation for my main um, role as a multimedia specialist, I did have to have basic knowledge of HTML, um, CSS, uh, not necessarily JavaScript, but I know a lot of positions will be looking for that. And you need to learn basically a lot of the different skills. So even though you may not think um, coding is essentially right for you, it's a good skill to have because a lot of positions will be looking for that, especially now since we're entering kind of like the digital age. And a lot of um, people are, are looking for what I like to call digital, digital literacy. So you essentially need to know how to like code and um, learn effective design skills. Um, also, media producer is a really good um, position that a lot of people I know um, are looking forward to doing. And in second year especially, you're learning a lot of the skills necessary for that job as well. So you'll learn how to use Photoshop, you learn um, how to use like Premiere Pro and different um, video um, producing elements. And for this year, for this term, we did have to make um, a few videos as well. So like visual presentations and video presentations about specific topics of community engagement. So you do learn like a lot of skills and a lot of transferable skills for your line of work in the future. Now you referenced one of your classes and, and I, I quickly posted a link uh, of some of the course descriptions from the uh, uh, from the website and, and and Vicky also added a really great kind of kind of course map uh, that shows the, the actual path of the program. So it gives you a, a sense as to uh, what type of courses you're going to need to take and uh, and where they're kind of situated and how it kind of progresses in a really kind of uh, intentional way. So uh, definitely check out uh, those those two links and their website to learn more about that. 
Um, before uh, we wrap things up, Julia, there was a really cool question. Um, and the question was, uh, what does a day in the life of a student look like? Do you have labs for students to work in? Do we need to have a lot like laptops? Is there a lot of group work? And you know, referencing that obviously right now there's a pandemic, a global pandemic, so things might be different. But uh, you know, prior to this year, you know, what was your kind of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, experience as a student walking, chatting, kind of living, breathing on uh, on the campus and studying in this uh, really unique program? Yeah, so the current day in the life of a student, you're doing everything online. So being organized is key because you have to keep track of your assignments and that sort of thing. Um, we do have labs specifically for the uh, coding classes. So they will essentially be tutorials to um, practice on the coding languages. Um, so I wouldn't fear those too much. Um, uh, having a laptop is necessary because you're going to be having to use a lot of um, not not only programming, but also of like digital software such as like Photoshop, um, Premiere Pro, Final Cut Pro if you're a Mac user like me. Um, yeah, so OK, I'm just going to continue reading the question. Is there lots of group work? There's going to be a lot of uh, group work specifically for the MPAD classes. I know in um, first year and second year, some of the final assignments were related to group coursework. And um, I found those were actually some of the most interesting um, assignments that we had throughout the program because you will be collaborating with like different museums such as the Nature Museum and I also collaborated with the NAC last year. So you will be given a lot of like different opportunities to kind of um, present yourself and your program in a positive light as well as like practice your art if that's something you want to do and it's it's honestly one of the coolest um, programs and assignments that I actually have done um, throughout my university. Um, going to class, so for online classes, we use Zoom a lot. So we're prac so um, they, the teacher will have a lecture video. It depends honestly on the class, like some of them are synchronous and some of them are asynchronous. And what we essentially mean by that is like synchronous have a specific um, meeting time. So like, for example, you tuned in to this um, live session and that's essentially what a synchronous class is. You're essentially joining um, an online class where the teacher might present a lecture video or they might actually give themselves a lecture for the duration of the class time. Asynchronous classes are um, you're essentially student driven, so the teacher might give you a few um, a few lectures to watch throughout um, the week and they may also give you um, course readings. And with asynchronous classes, what you have to keep in mind of is um, quiz times. So the teacher might not necessarily um, remind you that you have a quiz in like 15 minutes. That's essentially up to you to remember. So that's why I say it's important to stay organized because um, with the pandemic, um, staying organized is essentially one of the only ways that you can essentially have a great uh, university career. I'm not going to like butter your egg rolls or anything. I'm just essentially telling you the truth here. It's student driven. Um, in comparison with like on campus uh, classes that we had before the pandemic, it's essentially the same thing necessarily like they're giving you the same um, classes. They're giving you the same kind of session sessions that you would have if you're on campus. The main difference is you're not on campus anymore. You're at home and um, the teacher might also still give you emails to remind you of like upcoming assignments, but that's up to the teacher. That's not up to the university. OK, that's awesome. Thanks, Julian. I know this is a little bit of a different voice here. This is Carly. I'm just uh, stepping in for Stenton here for a second. Um, and I'm going to bring Vicky back up uh, just to talk a little bit about that uh, that classroom that you posted. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what is so special about uh, that particular classroom? 
Sure. So um, if everyone could take a look uh, at your leisure at the uh, link that I posted in the uh, Q&A. Um, that's one of the two active learning classrooms that we have on campus. And um, I am, am beyond delighted to teach in those rooms. Um, they're really, really nice. They're very modern and they're very, um, they, 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 their whole design supports a very um, collaborative and, uh, and really sort of forward thinking type of pedagogy. Um, so the space there, the, the top has a video, but if you scroll down, you can see some really nice pictures of the Tory Labs. And basically, it, it almost looks like what you'd imagine sort of those really cool hip Silicon Valley startups look like when you walk in. Um, there's sort of uh, LCD monitors all around the room that can project either the lecture slides or they can be sort of commandeered by the students to throw up their projects and show where they're at. Um, the tables and desks are all sort of customizable. There's couches and comfy, comfy furniture. There's whiteboards pretty much everywhere <laughs> except on the floor um, that can be sort of repositioned and, and used around. And so basically what happens is um, we, we do very short lectures in that semester. And then after, after we present or recap a little bit of theory or sort of a, a procedure for uh, prototyping, say, we then get right into sort of getting our hands dirty and trying things out. Um, I really love how configurable the space is. There's no true like front of the room. It's very much focused on everybody bringing something to the table and collaborating and connecting. Um, the other thing that's really great about it too is that uh, the students really make it their own space when they come in. Like they, they're very comfortable in that room. Um, I find it promotes a lot of really great discussion because no one feels like any one person is in sort of focus when they're talking in the room. It sort of uh, opens up everything to a lot of collaboration. So we'll reconfigure the space as needed and sort of use it to our advantage to support sort of group work and, and collaboration. Okay, that, that sounds awesome. And just before we wrap up, um, I'll ask you, Vicki, first since you're on screen and then we'll pass it over to Julia. Um, just one piece of advice for our prospective students who are, you know, considering media production and design, but just considering applying to Carleton in general, if you have a piece of advice for them moving forward. Um, I mean, I would just apply. This is a really exciting program. Um, I think what we're doing is, is quite novel with regards to sort of the collaborative nature of the program. And there really is a lot of space in MPAD to sort of make it your own. I remember when I was studying music as an undergrad and there was like, it was classical music all the time. Jazz was literally a four letter word. So they really were trying to create in my program one type of student, but we're really not trying to do that here. Um, many times the projects that you're doing in class that are solo work um, can be on any topic that interests you. So if there's something you're coming in uh, with regard to your own hobbies or the career trajectory you want, you can often use those uh, individual assignments to really explore that area um, as far as your craft goes. But then on top of that, like between um, the option to add a minor and to sort of take all the electives in different areas that you want, there's a lot of possibility for making this degree really your own. And because it's interdisciplinary, there's a lot of different places you can end up going with it. So I think it's a really, really great opportunity to really study something that's uh, really groundbreaking and on the bleeding edge. OK, yeah. uh, go ahead, Julia. Yeah. Yeah, um, just to add on to that, one of the most important uh, pieces of information that I could possibly give you is to stay open minded. So even if you're entering the program um, believing that it might not be for you or aspects of it might not be for you. Um, you might in fact change your mind. Like I went into this and I didn't necessarily um, think that coding would be for me either, but it turns out that parts of it I actually did really love. <laughs> So I learned how to um, do website design and graphic design, and I actually improved a lot of the skills that I didn't think I would have when entering the program. So just stay open minded, try out new experiences. And all in all, it's a great program to try out with if nothing else works. <laughs> But um, it's a great program and we sincerely hope that you will enjoy it. And it's a new program. So that's also another thing to keep in mind is that you're entering a community with various other students who are in the exact same boat as you. And who knows, you might actually make some of the best friends that you've had so far. 
Thank you so much for sharing that. And and I, I you know, I graduated a couple of years ago now, but I always say whenever I hear about this program that I wish it was around when I was applying to pro to university. So um, I get inspired every time I hear you folks talk about it, and I hope that our our future students um, feel that way today as well. So um, we will keep the Q and A open for another kind of five minutes or so. Um, but thank you so much, Vicky and Julia, uh, for joining us tonight. Um, and we hope to see you all soon. So thanks again uh, for everything.